So, uh, <clears throat> welcome everybody. It's uh, our first Monday seminar, and uh, yeah, it's a good pleasure. Our ex postdoc, and uh, who uh, from MIT will uh, give the first one. Uh, he also he will lecture tomorrow on uh, Tuesday, and he's also staying here uh, in Thursday. So, anybody who wants to talk to him, and he knows how to talk about lots of things. Uh, you know, just send him an email and uh, yeah, he'll be around. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm cool. The floor is yours. Uh, I'll also be the one with a scooter because I broke my foot, but that's fine. <laughs> it's amazing. He could have cancelled it. He could have it but... ah, when life gives you lemons. All right, so uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the diffraction limit and extremal functions. I don't expect you to know what any of that means. Um, actually, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview. So this talk will be about how to use ideas from learning theory to think about inverse problems in the sciences, specifically optics. And uh, tomorrow what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect these things to uh, learning from dynamics and dynamical systems. Um, so the first work that I'm going to talk about is actually a bit older. But Avi asked me to uh, give you a, you know, some background on on where these ideas come from. Uh, this is the second half of this talk will be joint work with um, my amazing former student Sitan Chen. So let me tell you a little bit about optics as someone who doesn't study optics either. Um, so the important thing is that uh, you know in optics many devices that we use are somehow inherently low pass. Now, I'll dig into what that means later, and we'll talk about actual physical models in the second half of the talk. But for right now, we can just take this as you know, a truth that, that people believe. Um, and super resolution is about this very natural question, which is what can we do in the face of these low pass devices? So if we're limited to only taking the low frequency measurements, is it still possible to get some kind of fine grained information about the objects that we're measuring? So in fact, uh, this topic you know, has tons of applications and things like you know, medical imaging, microscopy, astronomy, radar detection, geophysics. In fact, uh, about 10 years ago, it actually won the Nobel Prize in chemistry was exactly for super resolution cameras. These are incredible things. The way to think about it is that you know, when you have a cell and you wanna image a cell to understand how the underlying biology works, and you wanna see how the HIV virus enters the cell, the trouble is that if you apply too high a frequency of light, when you're measuring the cell, then you're imparting so much energy that at some point you destroy the thing you're measuring. So instead, the way that these super resolution cameras work is that they interfere with the system. They tag it with certain kinds of photolipids so that they only respond in certain wavelengths of light. And effectively, you're taking the contents of the cell and you're downsampling them at different frequencies in such a way that you can piece together a full view of the image. And that's exactly what's so amazing about super resolution cameras is that we can now see how the HIV virus enters the cell. So, you know, my goal today is really to build up some understanding of the mathematical underpinnings. As you know, what are the fundamental limits to resolution? When are there positive answers to this question about when we can recover fine grain structure? And let me tell you about a very popular and cool and natural mathematical framework, which was introduced by Dave Donahoe back in the 90s. And here we're going to keep matters simple. We'll imagine that we're trying to image a set of particles that live in one dimension. And each of these particles we're going to think of as being a delta function. So they have some location, you know, fj, and all of these particles are somewhere in the interval 0, 1. And moreover, we could think about these particles as having some coefficient, could be positive, negative, could even be a complex value. But at the end of the day, we're given some sort of sequence of delta functions, some linear combination of them. And the catch is that we're only allowed to measure it at low frequencies. So we get to integrate this linear combination of delta functions with some sort of complex trigonometric function where it looks like e to the i 2 pi omega t. Omega is the frequency. But the issue is that we're only allowed to apply omega up to some cutoff frequency m. So all of the omegas we're allowed to try have to have absolute value at most m. 
So just to make sure we're on the same page, you know, I'm going to think of x of t, the signal, as just the sum of these delta functions. Uh, uj is my coefficient for the jth spike. And the jth spike is at the location fj. And that's exactly the Dirac delta function at the location fj. Now, what happens when I integrate this linear combination of delta functions against a complex trigonometric function? What I get is I get an exponential sum. So I get sum from j equals 1 to k, there are k spikes of uj times e to the i 2 pi fj omega. And the thing that I'm allowed to do is I'm allowed to vary omega. And what I'd like to do is be able to recover fine-grained information about what the fj's and the uj's are. Now, I say fine-grained because the important thing is that the locations of these spikes are not at grid points. That's not an assumption we're willing to make. There are arbitrary real values in the interval 0, 1. We'd like to be able to localize them extremely well, even though we only have low frequency measurements. You tell us how to think, uh, you know, the relationship between k and n. Yeah, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's the question is can we recover the locations and coefficients? And I'm going to tell you right now that there'll be an important twist when we change the problem to allow noise. So it's not really reasonable to get exact measurements of the actual uh, exponential sum. But you can imagine that I get some small Gaussian noise. And maybe I want to know whether I can stably recover the locations and the coefficients in spite of this noise. So I'll get more into the history in a few minutes. This is a problem that you know, had renewed interest around uh, the mid 2000s. And uh, people were really excited about you know, proving super resolution bounds. But one of the things that um, you know, surprised me when I first started thinking about this was that you know, actually there's an ancient algorithm for doing this problem. That's way before Donahoe that you know, actually is one of the oldest algorithms you can think of. And it's something that usually gets forgotten. So what I claim is that this problem is completely trivial if you have no noise. There's an ancient algorithm due to Prony, which in the noiseless setting, what I claim is that there's a polynomial time algorithm to recover the coefficients and the frequencies. Remember, there are k of them each, just from 2k plus 1 distinct measurements. And it doesn't matter what the cutoff frequency is. So there's no relationship between k and m as long as you have distinct frequencies. So actually, Avi mentioned I was a postdoc here. I remember that um, I was giving a um, I was giving a tutorial on compressed sensing at some point. And uh, it sort of bothered me that everyone forgot about Crony's algorithm. So I started off the tutorial by writing down three truths about um, you know, compressed sensing that seemed like there were reasonable things, like no one knows how to do it with you know, smaller than k log n measurements. And I told the audience that at least one of the three statements I made was a lie. And they all debated. And it turned out they were all lies uh, because people had forgotten exactly about this algorithm. And I'll prove this algorithm, or at least a very close variant of it, that's called the matrix pencil method. That's a very, very simple proof that'll be extremely uh, useful for what comes later. But really, you know, now we want to study the maybe more realistic version of the question. So what happens if we have the same problem? I want to recover the locations and frequencies of my delta functions. But you know, I want to do so in a way that's stable to noise. You know, I could wonder, is Prony's method actually stable to noise? And it's definitely not. But let me tell you about the main results, and then I'll tell you a bit more about the history. So what I claim is that there's a separation condition between the spikes. And I'll tell you what that separation condition is in a minute. But imagine that all of the spikes are delta separated. What I claim is that there's a sharp phase transition for when super resolution is and is not possible. So remember that m is the cutoff frequency for how far you're allowed to go out. And what I claim is that there's a polynomial time algorithm for the noisy variant of super resolution if and only if m is at least 1 over delta plus 1. And otherwise, it's statistically impossible for getting algorithms. So let me tell you about the separation condition. Um, so it's very natural to assume that you can only measure at integer frequencies. In that case, you basically have an aliasing effect. 
And really the right way to define the distance function between the spikes is with the wraparound distance. So all the spikes are on the unit interval 0, 1. You take the unit interval and you glue it around a circle. And then the wraparound distance is just the shortest arc length between two spikes. And what I claim is that if the wraparound distance is at least delta, then you can solve noisy super resolution as long as the cutoff frequency is at least one over delta plus one. And I'm a theoretical computer scientist, so for the most part, I don't prove such sharp bounds, but this really is sharp down to the constant. So let me state the result a bit more precisely. So what I claim is that you know, if you have that the noise, the additive noise that I'm adding to my measurements is polynomially small in epsilon, 1 over m, and 1 over k, so as long as it's small enough, then the point is that um, you can recover estimates, f hats and u hats. Now, you can never recover which one is the first spike, but you have to look at the recovery under the best alignment of your estimates to the true ones. So what I claim is that there is some matching sigma that matches your estimates to the true thing. So that across this matching, you get everything right within an additive epsilon. You get the locations and the coefficients. And this is true as long as the noise is polynomially small. So the way to think about it is that above some threshold, m is at least 1 over delta plus 1, then the estimates to the true parameters converge at an inverse polynomial rate. And what I claim is that on the other side, even though we have Prony's algorithm, fundamentally the problem requires that the noise be exponentially small and nothing better is possible. And so the other side is that if I take any other epsilon and my cutoff frequency is one minus epsilon over delta, I claim there's a pair of signals that both satisfy my conditions. They're both delta separated, so they're valid starting points. And yet, these two signals generate measurements that are close on every measurement up to the cutoff frequency. And how close? They're exponentially close in K. I'm not going to prove the second part of the theorem, um, but I'll just show you by picture. It turns out that um, you know, a lot of these things are actually related to older learning theory results and things like mixture models. You want to create mixtures of Gaussians that are very close to each other in terms of their moments. You can do something very similar in Fourier land, but you use something called the Fayer kernel. And basically, you look at two Fayer, you know, two variants of applying the Fayer kernel. And you know, they'll look a bit like this. They look kind of like a Gaussian in the middle, but they have some oscillation at the tails. And you could set this up in a way that, um, you know, that the theorem holds, that there's no low frequency measurement that distinguishes them. So I'll basically skip over the lower bound, but really what I want to emphasize is I'm going to prove for you the full upper bound. So we'll prove the whole thing. So nobody asked any question yet, which bothers me. So of course, you're extremely clear, but asking questions if anything. I'm used to a lot of questions. <laughs> So don't stop me. Okay, let me tell you about some of the history of it because I kind of glossed over that. So Donahoe's paper was remarkable. Um, you know, 91, he introduced this model. He studied a model in which it wasn't really super resolution in the modern conception because basically what happens is that the locations of the spikes are on a grid, but you send the grid size to zero. And he studied asymptotic properties about how the grid length relates to stability properties of the inverse problem. Uh, but he proved the sharp bound 1 over delta, and we're going to do this off the grid, because that's what the goal is in super resolution. Uh, one of the works that got me excited about this was there is... It's not clear why you call it an inverse problem. Right. Uh, yeah, so. It's not clear why I call it an inverse problem. I agree. It'll become hopefully yeah, clearer I later. I cover it yeah, yeah, yeah. So that'll be the second half of the talk, where I connect it back to actual optics. Uh, the works that got me really excited about this where there is a pair of works by Candice and Fernandez Granda and Fernandez Granda, where they gave a really cool convex program that works very well in practice. And they showed that um, it gets recovery as long as the cutoff frequency is at least two over delta. But their analysis was in the case of no noise. So this is one of the things that I found a bit curious was that it's not really improving on Prony's method even though in practice it is a very uh, effective convex program. And Fernandez Granda, uh, around a similar time, um, 
you know, approved uh, version with noise, but up to this threshold two over delta. Uh, the paper that I'm going to be describing in the first half of the talk was from 2014. And uh, at the same time, there was this really nice concurrent work of Liao and Fang Jing, who showed an algorithm. They gave an analysis for an algorithm called MUSIC. And they got one plus C of delta over delta. So in the case where you know, delta is um, you know, tending to zero, they end up getting this one over delta in the case of noise. Um, we're going to prove just one over delta plus one. But uh, yeah, that work is really nice too. All right, so I'm going to start rolling up my sleeves metaphorically, and I'm going to tell you about not Prony's method, but an equally simple uh, algorithm, uh, which solves the noiseless recovery problem without any separation condition. Now, the main characters in the story will be a rectangular complex Vandermond matrix. So you won't yet see why this matrix is so important. Hopefully, we'll see that on the next slide. But for now, we'll just take this as a very important definition of something we're going to have to study. And you know, the two things that are going to play a role here, you know, it's V sub M super K. So K is the number of columns, because I have one column for each spike I want to recover. And M is the number of rows. Remember, M is the cutoff frequency. That's how many powers I'm going out to when I'm trying to solve you know, these super resolution problems. Now, uh, the columns of this matrix are just you know, uh, points on the moment curve. So what happens is I take my spike location, fj. I'm ignoring the coefficients uj for right now. And I store it as a complex unit. So I define alpha j equals e to the i 2 pi fj. And then what's going on is that I'm just taking it to different powers depending on the row that I'm indexing into this matrix. Which makes sense because, you know, the only ability I have in super resolution is I get to play with what goes in the exponent of this exponential sum. And that's really corresponding to changing what this row is. So this is my complex uh, rectangular Vandermond matrix. It's rectangular because M in general will be larger than K. But now I can give you basically a proof of a Prony-like guarantee. And it's ultra simple. It's going to fit just on one slide. So let me tell you about the matrix pencil method. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to form some matrix A for protect. So imagine I take this complex Vandermann matrix, this M by K matrix. I take it times a diagonal matrix, which stores all the coefficients, the UJs. And then I multiply it by the Hermitian of the Vandermann matrix. Now, what I claim, and this is this A from the left is the signal, is the measurement. Right? Uh, that would be if I removed the, um, yeah, if I removed the VH, yeah, 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 if I removed the VH, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that's exactly the way to think about it, and we'll get to that view in a second. But the key claim, which, you know, stop me if this doesn't make any sense, what I claim is that the entries in this matrix A correspond to measurements. So the way to think about this is just to make it simpler. Think about the K equals 1 case. So my first Vandermond matrix is just a column vector with different powers of alpha. Then I'm multiplying it by the coefficient. And then I'm taking the outer product with the Hermitian of that same row. And what's going on is that I just get different powers of alpha. You know, when I look in the resulting row and column, row I, column J of this matrix, it just looks like, you know, alpha to the I minus J times some coefficient. So now if I just take the outer product formulation for this matrix multiplication, it just ends up being the sum over i from 1 to k of the outer products of these that all correspond to different spikes. So what I claim is that this matrix A is a Henkel matrix. You know, It has some very nice structure to it. And if I have noiseless measurements of my system, then I can populate the entries of this matrix A. So this is probably one of the most important points in the talk. So uh, does anyone disagree with this claim? Makes sense? So all the diagonals are the same corresponding to some one of your answers. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to get my off by one. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same trick again. I'm just going to form another matrix. But now, instead, it'll be V times DU times D alpha times V Hermitian. So D alpha 
Oh boy, I get too many emails. Uh, D alpha is a diagonal matrix with alphas along the diagonal. So what's going on here is I'm forming another matrix B whose entries look like measurements for super resolution, except for the fact that you know, the powers are slightly different. Now it'll look like you know, the entry in row I column J looks like alpha to the I minus J plus one instead. So I'm just shifting the powers by one. But again, the same property holds that the entries of B as well, they correspond to measurements with omega being an integer between minus m plus one to m. Okay. And now we're done. So what I claim is that I have these two matrices A and B, which I can populate from my noiseless measurements, and I can solve a generalized eigenvalue problem. So the way to think about it is that if I took A and B, and I, you know, left multiplied both of these by, uh, if I, you know, if I took um, B, you know, B pseudo inverse times A, what's going to happen is I'm going to cancel out a bunch of the V Hermitians, and I'm going to end up with a diagonal matrix, which is diagonalized by V. So the way to think about it more precisely is that if you set up a generalized eigenvalue, so you problem where you look for vectors X. Not, uh, yeah, you should define it. Yeah, okay, let me do that. Let's just write this thing out. So this should be pretty easy. So what have I got? So I've got A is equal to V du V Hermitian. B is equal to V du V alpha V Hermitian. So what I can do is I can take B pseudo inverse times A. And what's going on is that I'm going to get uh, a whole bunch of cancellation. So I'm going to get V Hermitian pseudo inverse the alpha inverse du inverse, uh, and then the v uh, pseudo inverse v du v Hermitian. So everything is going to cancel very nicely here. And what I'm going to get is I'm going to get v Hermitian pseudo inverse d alpha minus one uh, times v Hermitian. So I canceled the V pseudo inverse and V. I canceled the DU inverse and the DU. And now what I'm getting is when I form this new matrix, B pseudo inverse times A, which I know A, I know B. Now, the important thing is that the eigenvalues of this matrix are exactly determined what the alphas are supposed to be. So that's the key point. Now, the way that you can set this up you know, without actually taking the pseudo inverse is you just look at the generalized eigenvalue problem. Yeah. That's for people who never saw this before. The normal eigenvalue problem that you know doesn't have a B matrix. It's just you are looking for solutions lambda to A x equal lambda x, right? These are the eigenvalues. And the generalized one is when you have another matrix B, not the identity. And so, Perfect. Uh, more complex. Uh, more complex, but you know that's exactly the key point. Is that um, you know now even without knowing the Hermitian here, the eigenvalues are still uniquely determined as long as they're distinct. So you know more precisely, you just solve this generalized eigenvalue problem: ax equals lambda bx, and all of the lambdas that you find are going to exactly have the property that they equal one over alpha j. So now in the noiseless case, I found my FJs. This is called the matrix pencil method. And you know, once you have the FJs, you can solve for the UJs. It's not very hard because basically you're solving a linear system on the van der Maan matrix from your measurements. But the hard part is really getting the FJs. So this is great, but let's take a step back and think about what we used here, right? So in order for this argument to make sense, I had to be able to take the pseudo inverse of V. So what that means is that I needed that it actually had full column rank. Otherwise, this thing wouldn't be true that I could do this. And so the point is that if I take that complex van der Maan matrix, what I really care about is when it has full column rank. Remember, it's an M by K matrix. So what I claim, and this is a well-known you know, standard fact, is that the Vandermond matrix has full column rank as long as 
the alpha j's are distinct, which happens then as long as the f j's are distinct. So now we're in good shape, but one of the questions we could ask is when is the matrix pencil method robust to noise? Because we could hope that, you know, that this whole procedure might work even in the presence of noise. Maybe I could have some matrix perturbation bounds for computing the generalized eigenvalues. And I could say that in some cases, depending on the alpha j's, that you know, the perturbations don't actually change the answer of what the generalized eigenvalues are by too much. So when is the generalized eigenvalue problem robust to noise? So I can start with when is eigenvalue problem robust to noise? Yeah, and that would be based, and you could start even with when is the eigenvalue problem robust to noise? And basically, the answers to those two questions are very intimately related. Turns out there aren't such nice bounds in the literature um, because most of the nice bounds only hold in restricted cases. But you know, in the full, fully gory detail, you kind of uh, there's a very nice book by Stewart and Son. I'm not going to show you the, the theorem for this because it's it's uh, takes up a full slide. But the key takeaway is that when I think about this resulting problem that I got out, this is really an eigenvalue problem. Right? when I take B pseudo inverse times A, what I claim is that the eigenvalues are stable to adding a perturbation, like a matrix perturbation to both sides, exactly when this matrix that diagonalizes it is well conditioned. So that's really what our main question is. Everyone knows when the Vandermond matrix has full column rank, but when is it the case that it robustly has full column rank? that even small perturbations don't change the fact that you can lower bound its smallest singular bound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that actually the super resolution problem, that sharp phase transition, really comes from the fact that there's a sharp phase transition in the condition number of the rectangular Vandermond matrix. Any questions? This is probably the first quarter. Maybe more. <laughs> All right. So let me tell you about condition number bounds. Um, so what I'm going to prove for you is that if I take this rectangular Vandermond matrix and I take any vector u that the two norm of you know the output v times u, the two norm square, is close to the two norm of u. This then is really an upper bound on the largest singular value of the matrix, as well as a lower bound on the smallest singular value. U has nothing to do with the previous U. Oh, sorry, it does not. Yeah, it's an it does not. It's an arbitrary U. Thank you. Good point. It has nothing to do with it. This is a totally general test vector. And now I get to tell you about something amazing. So let's take a little breather for a second. Let me tell you about an amazing function, uh, which I learned about here actually, uh, from Peter Sarnak. Uh, there's something amazing called the burling selberg matrix. So first look at the black curve, the sine function. So it uh, you know, starts off at minus one at minus infinity, and then it does something at zero, but it becomes plus one after the origin, all the way to plus infinity. Uh, this will be a big understatement. The sine function is not a very smooth function. Um, but what if I want to find a smooth approximator? This is the kind of thing that we do all the time. But there's this twist that in analytic number theory, a lot of times you want a smooth approximator that you know, is an upper bound everywhere for. So I don't just want to take the sine function and convolve it with some bump like a Gaussian, because that resulting thing would be an approximation, but it would be above at some places and below at other places. What if I want a good approximator that's always above? That's called a majorant. And I've drawn out here as best PowerPoint could oblige, uh, the burling selberg matrix. Yeah. If, if, if you have something which approximates it everywhere, why can't I just like shift that function up? Well, because it depends on the, the sharp extremal properties that I'll want, but we'll get into that in a second. So let me tell you the properties I want. So the first thing I want is that it's a valid majorizer. So I want that um, you know B of omega, this red curve, is everywhere an upper bound for sine of omega. Fine. I also want it to be smooth. So I want that the Fourier transform of B of omega 
which is be hat. I want that it's supported in the interval minus one to one, so that it doesn't actually use too high a frequency term. But now to Yang's point, you know, there are a lot of things that need conditions one and two. I could just take any old approximator to the sine function and shift it up, that'll be fine. But the point is that you wouldn't get such a sharp condition as three. So think about this, because this is actually quite surprising. The sine function, I'm looking at it from minus infinity to plus infinity. I want a smooth approximator, and yet the majorant has the property that the L1 norm of its difference to the sine function is one. And that's an integral over all of R. So it's quite shocking that uh, you can get such a good bound. And in fact, this is sharp. So if you satisfy one and two, the burling selberg majorant optimizes three, and this is the expression. I'll be amazed if someone has intuition for this. Uh, looks kind of opaque. Actually, there is intuition for it, um, but it's, you know, um, you at least have to have some harmonic analysis. So the idea is that if you look at just properties one and two, if you have, uh, sorry, if you actually just look at property two, if you have a function whose Fourier transform is supported in minus one, one, it turns out that you can interpolate the function just by looking at the values of the function at the integers. You don't have to look at the value of the function everywhere. And there are other variants of the interpolation formula where you instead, for every other integer, you look at the value of the function and the value of its derivative. So what happens is you take an interpolation formula for a function that satisfies condition two, it's bounded Fourier transform. And you take the sine function, which is definitely not bounded Fourier transform, but you plug in it to the interpolation formula, and that's how you get the burling selberg major. So you pretend that the function has the Fourier properties you do, and then as it turns out, amazingly, it ends up being sharp. Now, um, I'll get more into this later. I, I mentioned that the burling selberg major it really comes from number theory. Um, and you know, that's really, I'll get into it in a second, but for our purposes, what's actually more important is to have the notion of a minor. The same type of thing, we want it to always be upper bounded by the sine function, but I want similar properties that smooth and close. And what I claim is that, uh, you know, you can satisfy these conditions one through three, and the L1 difference between them is one. But uh, this, this is now trivial from the thing that I said before, because I can take the majorant and flip it. Now, what's even cooler, and this is why they come up in analytic number theory, is that you can not only approximate the sine function, you can approximate the indicator of an interval. So imagine I take the indicator of an interval e, which goes from 0 to m minus 1, so that it has length m. And what I could want to do is I could want to find upper and lower bounds, uppercase c and lowercase c, that sandwich the interval, the indicator function of the interval. I want them both to have bounded Fourier transform. And I want them both to be close to an L1. Here, I'm going to play this game where actually I want them to be Fourier transform supported in minus delta to delta for reasons that will come up in super resolution. But I pay the price that I dilate my L1 distance by a 1 over delta factor, fine. Now, the reason these things are useful in analytic number theory is that a lot of times you want to count how often primes land in certain intervals. And that ends up being a hard thing to count directly, but instead by smoothly approximating the interval, it gives you a better test function for actually you know, showing pseudo randomness properties of, of the primes. So it turns out that in number theory, the upper bound is more important because as long as you behave you know, against uh, intervals like a random set, then you prove pseudo random properties of the primes. But for us, it's actually the lower bound, the little c that's more important, because that's the thing that's going to prove that the van der Maan is not horribly ill-conditioned. So this is one interesting twist about how these tools from number theory end up being useful in a surprisingly statistical context. Yeah. Uh, is there a good intuition for why if you do this transformation to the sine function that you'll get an upper bound everywhere instead of just an approximation everywhere? Uh, say, say it one more time, please. Uh, so you said the construction for the for the majorant was you take the sine function yeah. and then you plug it into the interpolation formula. Yeah. Is there a good intuition no, or why? Absolutely not. Bound? No. Okay. 
<laughs> because one of the interesting twists is that this theorem is tight for any integer m. It's known to not be tight for any non-integer m. And in general, it's open. <laughs> so it turns out, yeah, that uh, I, we can get into it more later. But um, you know, the point is that you actually just have to be above the sine function at the points where the burling selberg major kisses it. But you should think of it a bit like Chebyshev approximation, where once you are you know, bounded at the actual points where the Chebyshev is tight, it's kind of like writing infinite dimensional LP, and then you can sort of prove through complementary slackness that it's the extremal thing. But that's kind of why the other thing is not tight for any non-integer m, is because there's a descent direction. But anyways, let's, let's take that offline. <laughs> um, so let me prove it for you. Once we have this you know, amazing magic bullet, the proof is easy. And you know, I want to take a step back first and say that you know, these burling selberg majorins get used all the time. Uh, but in older analytic number theory, like in the 40s and 50s and 60s. But what I'm claiming is that there's a way to think about them as a type of preconditioner for the Vanderbilt. That in effect, what's going on, as we'll see in the proof, is that they're really giving you a way to reweight the rows of your Vandermond matrix in such a way that it becomes well conditioned, very well conditioned. It's a scaling. It's a scaling. Yeah. It's just that it happens. It, it has it has to do with like what the Fourier transform of uh, the Berlin Selberg majorant is. So this is in effect a kind of oblivious preconditioner for the Vandermond. Just as long as the Vandermond has the separation condition, the scaling will do the trick. So let's do the proof. The proof is um, you know, pretty simple. It's just going to involve some tricks um, you know, and rewriting things in Fourier. But the expressions will be long, but hopefully very intuitive. So uh, let me just prove the upper bound. The upper bound is exactly identical to the lower bound, but you just use the minorant instead of the majorant. Um, but let's take you know, VU squared, which I want to prove an upper bound for. Now remember, in the very beginning of the talk, I wrote down these v sub omegas, which was my shorthand for the measurement of the exponential sum at the frequency omega. So what's going on when I take you know, v times u is I'm you know, creating an exponential sum. And the entries in that corresponding vector, they look at evaluations. They look like evaluations of the exponential sum at different frequencies. So this is all notational. You know, v times u gives me the exponential sum measurements at different frequencies. So the two norm squared is just the sum over all integer omegas from 0 to m minus 1 of the you know, norm squared of the measurement. Now let's play a trick. So let me take the delta. Well, where do we see u in the right hand side? Uh, because it's built into the v omega. So V omega was my shorthand for the measurement of the actual. So that includes the other view. Yeah. Not yeah. this view. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It the coefficient. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So just to be clear, right? I mean, I can skip back if it helps, but uh, you want me to go back to the original formula or OK? All right. Well, I thought if anybody wants it, we can. Yeah. OK, so in any case, let's play a trick now. Well, maybe you just write the exponential sum on top of the board. Uh, sure. So it's a huge uh, uh, yeah. Let's do this. Uh, I need to call it J to K UJ e to the I two pi FJ omega. Okay, this U is not the two. Yeah, some, that's coefficients. Right. some coefficients because I'm really allowed to vary what these coefficients are. And I want to prove that for any choice, the coefficients that this thing is well placed. Okay, so this is just definitional right now. Now, let me take the Dirac cone. So I'm going to take a bunch of delta functions which are set at the integers, and that's called the Dirac cone. Or to write it out analytically, it's just sum from t from minus infinity to plus infinity of delta sub t at omega. We are integers. Yes, t are integers. And now what I can do is I can write this discrete sum instead as an integral where I use both the Dirac delta function and the indicator function of the integral. 
So here it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity. Remember that h of omega, which is my Dirac cone, only picks out integer values for omega. And the indicator function of the interval e only picks out you know, things which are in the interval 0 to m minus 1. So this is literally the same thing. Right? Now let's um, you know, upper bound it. What else am I going to do with my majorant? Is you know, I use the fact that the majorant is an upper bound for the indicator function of the interval. I'm integrating something that's always non-negative, so I get an upper bound. And now let's um, remember what v omega is. So you remember I wrote down this v omega here. And what's going on is I replace the norm squared of v omega with this exponential sum. So I'm going to get a double sum over j and j prime from 1 to k. And I'm going to get you know, uj, uj bar, uj prime bars in there. But the important thing is that I'm getting this e to the i 2 pi and then fj minus fj prime times omega. So the expressions get a little bit messy, but they're simple at the end of the day. And now we're just going to play one more trick, which is that the Fourier transform of a comb is a comb. So this is a basic property in Fourier analysis that's very useful. Um, so what this means is that uh, you know, if the Fourier transform of a comb is a comb, that means that another way to write h of omega is the sum from t from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i 2 pi t omega. That's like putting a delta function at the frequency omega instead, uh, t instead. So now what I can do is I can plug in for h of omega the second view of the delta function, and I'm going to get a triple sum. And then everything will be simpler after this, I promise. So we have the sum from t equals minus infinity to infinity. Notice that I've got this extra e to the i 2 pi t omega just from plugging it in. And now I can just collect all the exponents, right? So the important thing is what that turns into is it turns into the Fourier transform. So if you look at what's going on in the integral, you know, what happens in the exponent of the e to the i 2 pi, if I collect all the terms, is I get fj minus fj prime, you know, uh, plus a t in there. So that's literally the definition of the Fourier transform evaluated at what? fj minus fj prime plus t. And now life becomes really simple. I have this triple sum, but I claim that all of the non, all of the off diagonal terms completely go away. So the way to think about it is that remember c hat is supported on the interval minus delta to delta. But fj minus fj prime are always at least delta. So the only way that I can actually make it be in the part where c hat is non-zero is actually if j equals j prime and t equals zero. So this triple sum just turns into a single sum, and I get you know, the norm of uj squared times the Fourier coefficient of the burling selberg majorant evaluated at zero. So all I did was I played some tricks with the, delta, with the Dirac cone, and I used properties of the burling selberg major. And now we're in good shape because, you know, what is the c hat e of zero? It's just the integral of the function, right? And I know that that's supposed to be, at most, 1 over delta plus the integral of the interval because c, c e is supposed to be close to the interval. So what that means is I get my upper bound, that it's upper bounded by the length of e, which is m, plus 1 over delta times the you know, norm squared of uj. That's the proof. That's it. And the same exact proof works the other direction. Instead, you have you know, lowercase c instead. And then you get a minus 1 over delta. And that minus, that's the thing that tells me that as long as m is at least 1 over delta plus 1, then I'm going to get a non-zero coefficient, I'll get some positive lower bound, which proves a lower bound on the smallest singular value. So this was nothing was known before about the stability of Van der Moen. Nothing. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Despite the natural. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> the other interesting thing is that, um, you know, the other direction, which is that it's known that when the Berlin-Selberg major fails, 
that you can't prove the types of inequalities that you use to, you know, it for. But the other thing is that when it's not true, the Vandermann is exponentially ill-conditioned. And, you know, that gives you a sort of stronger failure to the type of approach. It's not that it's smallest singular value is zero. It's just that it really is exponentially small in K. So there's a sense in which, you know, these, um, you know, these extremal functions are really, the way to think about them is as preconditioners. And it really is related to when this inverse problem is well posed. Um, so what I did was, you know, I have two talks, you know, today and tomorrow. The break point is not exactly going to be at the end of this talk. We're going to get a little bit through this. But the two things which, you know, don't a priori appear at all related, you know, learning in optics and uh, learning from linear dynamical systems, I claim will have roughly the same structure. But I'll probably get a little bit through uh, the next part and we'll sort of resume next time and, and connect it to LDSs. Sorry, was there a question in the back? Yeah. Um... Could you go back to the last slide? Yeah. You only use one inequality here, right? And it's actually an equality, like, and it's actually an equality, right? Well, so I also used an inequality when I talked about uh, the approximation sure. for C uh, between IE and C. So the other side, when I prove the lower bound, that really is an inequality that can be strict like in cases where the burling selberg major you know, isn't good enough to prove a, a condition number lower upper bound. So the theorem is really, you, you will have an upper bound and a lower bound. Yeah, and the same proof. Yeah, but the difference is the plus and the minus of one over the other. That's right. Because here, you know, this inequality goes the other direction. It's lowercase c. Everything else is an equality until I get to this point right here, at which case I want a lower bound on little c hat e. And that lower bound comes from the length of the inter, you know, the L, the integral of the interval, which is e, but then minus one over delta, because that's how close it is. So I need that one over delta is less than m in order to prove a non-trivial bound. And that's it. Okay, awesome. I wanted to go slow and I succeeded. Okay, so this paper was from 2015. It's a bit later these days. Um, so, you know, when I started giving talks on it, I had a colleague, Piotr Indyk, who, you know, invited me to give a talk on it. And then um, I didn't have this prelude about super resolution cameras. And he mentioned to me, hey, you should probably talk about super resolution cameras. They won the Nobel Prize recently. So of course, you know, it's good fodder for a talk. I get to put that nice little medal with the Nobel Prize. But I also went and read the Nobel Prize laudation. And the laudation was really interesting because, you know, the way that they were formulating thinking about super resolution as an inverse problem wasn't the way that Donahoe wrote it. It was actually a bit different because it came from first principles physics. So let's try and take another stab at super resolution, one that's even more physically principled but the same mathematics will be useful. So it turns out that this problem now has been studied for even longer. This goes back to the 1850s. Um, and the idea is that if you think about a perfect optical setup, think about an astronomy, maybe where you have a faraway star. Now, the best case scenario is if the lens that you're observing the star through has a perfectly spherical cross section. And then what happens is you can look at what happens to the diffraction pattern through that lens. There's something called Fraunhofer diffraction, which tells you the density function of the photons that you observe in this 2D observation plane. So I have a far away star, I'm observing it through a perfectly spherical lens. And at the end of the day, I have a screen and I'm literally collecting photons. Those are my samples. And I'd like to learn something about the system I'm measuring, whether there are one or two stars or it's some other configuration. Now, the diffraction pattern that you observe is called an airy disk. Let me tell you what an airy disk is. So you go back to the yes. picture. So the lens is the place where the circle is drawn? Yeah, that's right. And what are the blue things? Uh, this is some illustration of Fraunhofer diffraction in terms of how the things interfere with each other. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. And in fact, equally mysterious until we try and demystify it. So I'll do that later. This is the airy disk. 
So the actual diffraction pattern you get, it looks like that little picture on the right. That's the intensity pattern that you observe different photons. So if you have a faraway star, you know, this is what it looks like. It looks sort of like, you know, a dot. And it, the dot, it sort of has a, an intensity function that looks a little bit Gaussian. But then it has these rings that oscillate and decay. And you can write down the precise form for the airy disk, and it has something to do with Bessel functions of the first kind. Now, the important thing is that uh, there's some physical property of your system. In the case of you know, astronomy, it would be what's called the numerical aperture of the lens that governs the parameter sigma that tells you how dilated this you know, airy disk is. And I'll give you another interpretation of an airy disk later that I think is at least more intuitive for me. But this is you know, what people study in optics. This was um, you know, first introduced and computed by, uh, by Airy back in the 1850s. And um, you can interpret whatever this function is, I of x, as the infinitesimal probability of detecting a photon at any point in this observation plane. So you're sitting there with receptors and calculating how often photons you know, hit. And as I mentioned, oh, it was actually 1835. So um, you know, actually since the time of Airy in the 1830s, uh, people have believed that uh, physics imposes some kind of fundamental limits to diffraction. And the way that they argue about that is that you imagine that there's two stars that are very close to each other in terms of the angle between them. And you know, if you have these two stars, the diffraction pattern you observe is going to look like a superposition of airy disks. You literally take these two airy disks and you add them on top of each other. Because the photons you're getting, you're not sure whether they're from one star or from the other. And now as you take these airy disks and move them closer and closer together, it looks like it gets harder, right? It looks like you know at some point uh, you stop seeing that there's two precisely well-defined you know blobs in there. And the main question that you know I'm going to pose, and I'll tell you at least about the main results, and we'll talk about it next time, is you know are there mathematical, statistical, algorithmic ways to make precise about what the limitation is about diffraction? The uh, truth was that you know, for a long time, we thought about things like learning mixtures of Gaussians, which have the same property that when you take two Gaussians and you put them too close to each other, at some point, the density function becomes unimodal in the middle. But the truth is that that doesn't stop you from learning a problem. You can still use things like the method of moments to do it. And maybe we can use ideas from learning theory to understand you know, what is and isn't possible for this inverse problem of determining from the photons you observe whether there's one or two stars. So in fact, uh, you know, the more we looked into this, the more confused we got. Uh, so I told you that this laudation was making this argument that when the two area disks are too close to each other, the problem is impossible. But that doesn't really fit with our intuition from mixtures of Gaussian, where we know that that's not true. Um, it turns out that there's not one diffraction limit. There is you know, half a dozen or a dozen of them. So people have suggested all kinds of notions about you know, what the minimum pairwise separation is you need between these point sources, depending on the numerical aperture and properties of your system in order to be able to resolve it. There's stuff due to Raleigh. There was even stuff in the 1900s due to Sarah. And which, if any, of these criteria are the right ones? So what exactly did they do? Did they postulate this or they prove something? What did they do when they... Let's see. <laughs> no, you will tell us what... Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, okay. yeah um, you know, in, in my other life, when I teach uh, sophomore level classes, a lot of times I teach the intro to proofs class. And, uh, you know, some of these things fit on different ends of the spectrum of what is a proof. Um, so, you know, when Raleigh proposed this heuristic, you know, he, he had no, um, no illusions that this was supposed to be, you know, an actual uh, real criteria. He just meant that as like, you know, when some kind of undulation condition is met, then probably the problem should not be possible. And he just, you know, you go back to his original paper and there's a nice quote from him, which basically comes down to the fact that this is a convenient rule. Don't take it too literally. And over the years, people um, had varying degrees of proofs. 
Uh, you know, in some cases, they would study situations where you had an infinite sequence of, you know, airy disks that were evenly spread out on, a, on the integer points. And they studied properties of like when the thing is well posed. That's going to sound a lot like the beginning parts of the talk, like in Donahoe's work. And they could actually make arguments about, you know, things that were impossible. There were many other refinements uh, with varying degrees of rigor. Let me call out Carol Sparrow as uh, one of the most egregious ones. So what he said was, um, you know, at least when I teach proof-based math, on the first day we have this top 10 proof pitfalls, you know, like proof by intimidation. Avi, how could you not understand this? And one of the other ones is, you know, um, proof by appeals to authority, right? And so here, Carol Sparrow says, of course my condition is right. I checked it with my friends and colleagues. Not a very good proof. I think um, one of the only quotes which I agree with is if you go back to Feynman's introductory lecture series in his wave mechanics class, um, you know, he, he put it very well, which is that it's a little pedantic to put this much precision into a formula. If you really had two airy disks, of course you could breach the diffraction limit. So that's morally correct. We'll see why that's true. Uh, but there's also another subtlety which comes out in super resolution in this physical setup that um, you know, has an interesting twist to it. So what I'm going to ask is whether we can put the diffraction limit on a rigorous foundation, especially in a model which really comes from first principles physics. That's very Feynman also, you know, it was the proof by authority, his own authority. I mean, it's yeah. clearly you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll have to prove that first part of Feynman's thing, too. I agree, that's not a proof. <laughs> but there'll be a second twist to it that's more interesting. So I think I'll stop here after I tell you the main results. So the first thing we're going to do is, you know, coming from learning theory, we know that we can learn mixtures of Gaussians without any separation condition, as long as there's a constant number. Let's do that. There is no diffraction limit. So what I claim is that if you give me samples from this you know, diffraction pattern, because you're actually getting samples from the photons, as long as these stars are delta separated and there's k of them, and k is a constant, which is quite reasonable in astronomy, there's no diffraction limit. So you end up with something that's exponential in k, but it's polynomial in all the other parameters and can learn estimates of the centers of the disk to any desired accuracy epsilon, and the dependence on epsilon is a polynomial. So in astronomy, there is no diffraction limit. Sometimes you're trying to tell the difference between a single star and what's called a double star. But you never really have more than two or three stars that are very close in angular separation. So this you know, lends credence to why exactly these fields don't believe in the diffraction limit. So wait a minute, what? Yeah. So they define the diffraction limit. Yeah. What is the diffraction limit? There is none right now. No, I know there is none. <laughs> let's do that on the next slide. What yeah. doesn't exist? Yeah, yeah, let's do that on the next slide. So, but one of the, the thing I'm hinting at is that you can think about a diffraction limit in terms of statistical foundations of given a reasonable number of samples to some reasonable accuracy from the scattering picture. How well can you actually resolve what the original you know, point locations are? There are some cases where the relationship between how many samples and what precision you need in terms of collecting the locations of photons and your estimates of the centers, they scale polynomially versus exponentially, and those can be very different. So let's, um, you know, uh, let's try and answer Avi's question. Let me tell you about the second suite of results, which is more interesting even. What I claim is that you know, the right way to think about the diffraction limit is really as a phase transition. So what if we have a large number of centers k? And we want to understand you know, when I need polynomial versus exponentially many samples. So we'll define two parameters, uh, gamma plus and gamma minus, that are a bit separated from each other. We're not going to be able to exactly pin down the right diffraction limit, but it'll be between these two thresholds, 1.53 and 1.15. And what I claim is that on the one hand, you know, if the mixture is well separated according to this gamma plus criteria, then there's a polynomial time algorithm for learning mixtures of airy disks. So you take a polynomial number of samples from your diffraction pattern, because it really is an infinitesimal probability of observing photons. You take a polynomial number of samples, and you can localize 
uh, centers of the airy disk, you can determine whether there's one or two or the number k, you know, to within an epsilon and find their centers. But on the other hand, there is a mixture of airy disks, which is, you know, roughly gamma minus separated, that has the property that you need exponentially many samples in order to solve it. So the way to think about it is that, you know, with any reasonable physical setup, you have a finite exposure time. You're only collecting photons for so long, or maybe even worse, you know, you can only collect the locations of the photons with some, you know, small accuracy. So if you're trying to do imaging beneath this diffraction limit, that's somewhere between 1.53 and 1.15, you're gonna have a bad time because you need incredibly sharp precision in collecting the location of a photon to be able to say anything, even of whether there's one or two centers kinds of things. So there is a diffraction. Right. Yeah, but you said in the previous. Yeah, maybe so the, the point is problem. that, yeah, yeah, let me go back. Right. So the point is that many of the arguments, in fact, almost all of them that were used in these different criteria were all about thought experiments where you have two airy disks and you're trying to tell it apart from one airy disk. What I claim is that when there's only two, there is no limit because it's a smooth phase transition. The right, you know, and that was really what Feynman was arguing was that if you're given infinite precision, then you can do whatever. But the truth is that the diffraction limit emerges when you think about it statistically as a phase transition. In fact, there's a cool way to plot this. Uh, let me just go to the plot where you can visualize it. So in the case where all of the centers are on a 1D line, then you can exactly pin down the diffraction limit, and it'll be the same as the one I told you in the first part of the talk. But what you can do is you can look at how many samples you need in order to decide the number of centers as a function of the separation condition. And you can do this for different values of k. And what happens is that around this critical threshold where delta is pi, which corresponds on this you know, x-axis to zero, you have this bending, almost as if it's light beams going through a prism, where the statistical complexity goes from changing polynomially as you vary k to growing exponentially. So as soon as k is like 10 or 12, it becomes completely infeasible in order to actually get that many samples or get that kind of precision for their locations to actually solve the hypothesis testing problem. So this is the picture in terms of thinking about where the diffraction limit is. On one side, you know, what happens is that there's a polynomial relationship, but on the other side, it's exponential. And if you only study it for k equals two, if I just gave you that first blue curve, you wouldn't see this diffraction limit emerging because the problem doesn't really get that much harder. It only emerges as you study you know, sequences of these problems instead. And as it turns out, this uh, you know, condition number of the van der Vandermond matrix is exactly gonna tell us these pictures. It's gonna be able to tell us why there is a diffraction limit in these physically you know, uh, motivated setups for inverse problems. So I'll prove the rest of that next time. And then I'm also going to tell you how ideas from super resolution can help you do things like learning the underlying dynamics from how it evolves. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, there's really a dictionary between what happens in super resolution and what happens in linear dynamical systems, where all of these things about condition number of Vandermond matrices are going to show up again, but in a non-commutative way. So I'll stop there. We're all probably hungry, but I'll take some questions and if not, hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot. No questions. So maybe this is not a super well formed question, but I want to ask like what's special about k equal to two? Because it's not just this problem have this phase transition when you go beyond to like many other questions also have this property. So I was wondering, do is there an easy explanation of why that's the case? Well, it's kind of like, um, so if we think about, I mean, uh, probably the explanations are different in different areas, but um, for this one, the way to think about it is that uh, for the Vandermond matrix I mentioned, uh -huh. that um, you know, when you're beneath this critical threshold, you have exponentially large condition number, but it's exponentially large in K. So K is not that big, so it's not that big a deal when K is two. And it's kind of like, you know, when you're solving systems of linear equations and Vandermond matrices, like if they were over the reals, 
it would really correspond to things like polynomial interpolation. So you can do things like polynomial interpolation, like Lagrange interpolation, pretty well when it's a small number of points and pretty horribly when it's a large number of points. So that's kind of the you know, commensurate phase transition that you want to think about is that um, it's just that you know, over the complex plane, there's some more subtlety because there are cases where k is large and it still is possible. Wait, so that means actually any small constant should be fine or? A small constant for what? Like a three, like k. Yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. Exponential, yeah. Four, yeah. Four. Exponential in two and three is totally fine. Okay. So yeah. That's fine. It's not such a big deal. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, part of the reason why, you know, not only are there many diffraction limits that have been proposed, but, you know, people have different levels of belief in them, depending on what domain they're working in. So people who are in astronomy don't believe in the diffraction limit because you don't really have that many objects that are that close to each other. But in microscopy and cells, people definitely believe in the diffraction limit because all these contents of the cells are extremely closely packed. And then there's not really a hope of learning them unless you actually tamper with the system a la super resolution cameras. So just yeah, go ahead. So, 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 so this is kind of like a physical question. So, so, for, so astronomers, when they actually measure like uh, to actually plot this area, basically actually need to quite a few photons, I would guess. So is that like how- They do, but the other thing is that a lot of what they do in astronomy is very heuristic based. Mm -hmm. So basically there's a very natural thing you can try if you don't believe in the diffraction limit, which is I have my scattering pattern and then I just try a whole bunch of, you know, guesses for where the two centers are. And I measure how good the fit is, you know, mm -hmm. of my estimated analytic expression compared to the observed thing. Now, the trouble is that if you don't have rigorous guarantees, it's impossible to give any hypothesis, you know, confidence intervals mm -hmm. on, you know, the belief that it really is one or two stars. So, so how, how, how much actually, like, uh, how does it, like, uh, what your method actually gave for numbers, like for astronomers? So does it, like, for astronomers say imply that, like, that they should be always fine or, like, uh, um, there's no <laughs> This is a longer discussion, but, you know, I'm very interested in understanding how uh, tools from learning theory can be useful for thinking about inverse problems in the science. Mm -hmm. Now for things like learning mixtures of Gaussians, it's really like an inverse problem for the heat equation because the Gaussian is the Green's function for the heat equation. And there are many other types of things where you can think about, I wonder if I could run this differential equation backwards. Um, but, uh, you know, here on the one hand, like these things say when you can rigorously prove confidence intervals, it's a bit subtle. <laughs> it's a bit subtle because, you know, the algorithm isn't actually going to be very different than the things they would try. So I think a lot of the ways where, you know, theoretical learning can make inroads for inverse problems in the sciences is really when it has a different prescription for what algorithms to run. This will not be one of those cases because you know we'll be working in low dimensions and it'll really just give us estimates that if you have a very good fit, it can't be an accident and it's because you really do have two or more centers kinds of things. But we can talk more about the philosophy offline maybe. So you will prove, uh, you will prove this result tomorrow, you'll see, but yes. just as uh, one bit, do you also here like in mix of Gaussian with moments so yes yeah. yeah yeah exactly so you can think about what we were doing here as really being a type of moment problem but it's with exponential sums the reason I presented the matrix pencil method that way was it's very related to something called tensor decompositions that are used all throughout learning theory I didn't talk about it but that's where it comes from and those same tensor decompositions and moment problems are going to be useful throughout for super resolution and for learning linear dynamical systems. More questions? All right, thanks.